Dr. Dragoo was still at work on that survey when I left. He still had before him the laboratory job of compiling the information, classifying the artifacts, and assembling it all in a final report to the Park Service. Now let's look at our second archaeological project, another example of the way everyday events play a part in scientific research. The story of this project begins in Roanoke Rapids, North Carolina, a town representative of the expanding economy of eastern North Carolina and Virginia. This is a busy community and its growth has brought about the need for more electric power, increased use of appliances, more air conditioning, power for industry in paper mills and textile mills. To handle this constantly increasing demand for electricity, the Virginia Electric and Power Company has been building dams and hydroelectric plants. The Gaston Dam was under construction on the Roanoke River, and its reservoir would flood numerous archaeological sites. This was a private dam, and there would be no archaeological salvage under National Park Service auspices. When the Federal Power Commission issued the license to build the dam, a clause was inserted recommending that the power company see that salvage was done. The company had been in this situation before. They budgeted money for archaeology and made arrangements to have it done by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. In Person Hall are located the research laboratories in anthropology. The director of the laboratories is Dr. Geoffrey L. Coe, a veteran of many years of archaeology in this area. In his research lab, Dr. Coe was able to turn immediately to well-organized reports on earlier work along other parts of the Roanoke. The illustrations of woodland pottery are characteristic of the detail one finds in such reports. Since the specimens were available in the research collections, Dr. Coe often checked them to make sure of some of the differences between earlier and later types he expected to find in the area to be covered by the Gaston Reservoir. The research collections are organized much like a library, so that you can find what you want with little trouble. The uneven texture of this pottery fragment was made by pressing the surface with a fabric. The clay is of relatively poor quality. On this one, the rim is flared and uneven. All this pottery is from the early formative stage. I visited Dr. Coe when his survey work at the Gaston Reservoir was nearly finished and the digging was underway. The men were excavating considerably deeper than the occupation level because the Indians had dug deep trash pits and storage pits. The main occupation showed at the bottom of the gray earth as a dark zone full of broken mussel shells. This was the trash left behind by a seasonal riverside camp of the Indians. The mechanical shaking screen was useful for steady, fast shoveling. Anything found on the screen was put into a bag labeled according to the section and depth where the men were working. At another part of the same site, the wall of the excavation was being cleaned for a better look. While we were there, Dr. Coe received one of his frequent visits from men of the Virginia Electric and Power Company, which was building the dam and supporting the archaeological work. These men, Mr. Glass and Mr. Rogers, were in charge of clearing the forest from the reservoir area and the relocation of roads. They had helped Dr. Coe many times, providing local information and preventing looting of sites by relic hunters. Dr. Coe is well known among archaeologists for his insistence on neat, exact work. It also pays off in scientific returns. A wall cut as smoothly as this one sometimes will make it possible to see subtle soil changes that might be missed in a more irregular job. 
But this doesn't mean that everything was done with shovels and trowels. Dr. Coe's assistant, George Hicks, brought machinery into play. The bulldozer was used only after the hand digging had progressed far enough so that they could tell whether they would gain more information by quick removal of the upper dirt. George planned to dig a single narrow trench, which meant he had to backtrack exactly so as to leave straight walls and a level floor, which would not require too much hand work to clean up. An inexperienced hand can do a lot of harm in a situation like this, leaving a ragged floor or going too deep. George had a graduate degree in history and was on his way to one in anthropology. He knew his field archaeology. He could manage men, and he could manage a bulldozer. Mighty handy man to have around. Several miles farther up the river, another of Dr. Coe's crews was at work. They had dug a long test trench by hand to cross-section the site. The side of the trench intersected an old fireplace, which the Indians had placed in a little pit. The earth was baked red. Ralph Bunn was completing the trimming of the trench wall there. Jeff Reed was making a scale drawing of the wall. Toward the river was a deep layer where the Indians had been throwing their trash down the old bank. The screening here was strictly non-mechanical, one girl power. The girls were students at the Women's College of the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. They had been beginners in this work at the start of the season some weeks before, but they certainly seemed to know what they were doing when I was there. The things they were finding were all gummed up with clay and dirt, broken pieces of mussel shell, flint, pottery, and animal bones. Later on, these would be washed in the lab and would tell their stories. While we were watching this operation, Dr. Coe told me how he thinks these finds fit into the whole story of the prehistory of the eastern United States. He said that the usual textbook sequence of woodland followed by Mississippian doesn't fit here. The Indians moved around too much to leave such a neat picture, and also they were too far from the main centers of development in the Ohio and Mississippi valleys. These were simpler folk, practicing some agriculture, and moving to the river when the season was good for collecting and eating shellfish. And that's the story of our second project. Our first project began with a flood threat in Pittsburgh, followed through the drawing up of an agreement with the National Park Service, and ended with a scientific report. In our second project, people needed more electricity, and from that came archeological research. Private enterprise put up the backing, and again, a scientific report will result from it. These two stories serve to illustrate that even though archaeologists spend much of their time dealing with the past, they need to know their way around in the modern day world. A scientist like myself has to deal with people, with budgets, with deadlines. In other words, science is a part of everyday 20th century life.